What is going on, Knicks fans? How we doing? Great to be here. Great to talk Knicks. Um, it's been a fairly quiet week, I would say, which sometimes is good. You know, it could be a, a calm before the storm type thing, but it was kind of nice to just have a time where we weren't just bombarded by by rumors of, of sorts. Um, in fact, it kind of fell. How do I put this? If anything, today, it kind of felt like looking internally and then looking at what might be happening across the river, specifically the East River, and um, getting a feel for what's going on with Brooklyn, or at least what could be. So, you know, I mean, here, here's the beauty of this podcast, right? Like, we can talk about the Knicks because we're going to, right? It's a it's Knicks film school or Knicks fans. We can talk about it, but we can also just talk about basketball generally and how it directly and indirectly can impact the Knicks. But the thing about the Nets, because I feel like it's a fun topic to, to discuss, right? Why not? Um, they're just so fascinating to me because they're in this position where if you look at their roster, right, it's Kevin Durant, a superstar, true superstar, getting up there in age, but still dominant. And you look at the end of the, the the rest of the roster, right? It's um, it's Kyrie Irving, where now there's the report where the Nets maybe aren't even comfortable giving him an extension that goes long term. Um, how that impacts them, you know, you've got Ben Simmons there who has still not played a game since he was with Philadelphia in last year's playoffs. Joe Harris is 31 years old. He's got two years left of the contract. He basically has the Evan Fournier contract, but is older, um, has an ankle injury, and there's no team option for the final year. So obviously the additional team option would be, you know, the third year if there were a third remaining year, but there isn't. And so it'll be fascinating to see if the Nets get out of that situation. And you've probably seen that if the Nets, for whatever reason, let Kyrie Irving walk away, they would then not have cap space because they are operating well over the cap. And so there's the prevailing thought, at least that I've had, maybe some of you have had it as well. It's like, well, what happens if the Nets don't sign Kyrie, right? Because it could go a number of ways. They could finally have um, Kevin Durant apply the pressure and say, look, I signed a five-year contract. James Harden didn't sign a contract. Kyrie Irving wants to re-sign. We, we're not at a point where we can just let players go and I'm the only one here so he could put pressure on the Nets because what else are they necessarily going to be able to do in that position you could have them not do anything and kind of just have Kyrie be a free agent if he really wants to go to a worse team that has cap space then that's something they can sort out but is Kyrie going to sit out and then request a trade honestly he might if you're a small market team and you have cap space and don't know what to do with it, and you have a handshake agreement with Kyrie that you will essentially sign him, he doesn't have to play, and then you'll trade him when the time comes. The question then is, what is Kyrie's value in a few months after that? Because I'm sure there are teams that would be interested in terms of his talent, but there's baggage that comes with him. And then there's the thought process of uh, Kyrie opting in. If he opts into his player option, that gives Brooklyn full control and Kyrie signs up for the money but doesn't really get anything. And I think that was also what was so fascinating about this idea, really the report, where Sean Marks and um, Rob Palinka meeting, I believe it was true, uh, and basically discussing whatever it was, wherever they were, and the framework you have to think would be something involving Russell Westbrook, because even though the Lakers say they don't want to attach picks, that's posturing right now. No one goes into the the free agency or trade period and says like, hey, you know, we're willing to attach picks. It's cool. It's, it's all posturing. And then you kind of let it go from there. It'd be a hilarious trade. But it's the sort of thing where, again, if you're also Brooklyn, you can find ways to make things happen. But it's tricky because you have spent so much money. And I'm not just talking about the salary cap. There's also the tax apron, right? So right now, the Nets are not hard capped. They 
can't really be because if they were, then they'd hit the tax apron and you can't go above it. So if you're Brooklyn, if you basically did something like the roster as is, and then just spitballing here, for example, right? Like let's say it's uh, Kyrie Irving for DeAndre Ayton. Well, base your compensation, our favorite term, comes into play. There are ways to get around it, but the true issue there is, well, a sign and trade gets you hard capped. If you are acquiring a free agent and you're signing him and then trading for him and he's not under contract already, you get hard capped. The Suns would not be hard capped if Kyrie Irving opts into his player option, but if he opts out, and then signs and trade, whatever. I mean, again, it's not going to happen. Just an example. So it's really tough, the position that the Nets are in, because they don't really seem to want Kyrie. And yet at the same time, uh, they're kind of stuck with him. And so then it's the whole thought process of if they're this adamant about not keeping him, what does that mean for Kevin Durant? Are they then trying to rebuild as a franchise? It's crazy. But Again, it's it's the sort of thing where it's not a position I would envy. And it's funny, too, because I know that other fans may disagree. I know I'm in the position where right now, if you told me that there was a very fake attempt at contending, I'd be disappointed. And were my team, the reason I would be disappointed is because, yes, could one thing go right and it changes everything? Sure, 100%. But you also then kind of like look and see what is more realistic and then the aftermath of that. And so it's like, are you pretending for a few years and then you're back in a similar position that you were in when you were rebuilding? It's tricky. Like, it's the sort of thing where back in, what was it, 2014, with the whole Carmelo Anthony situation, my personal viewpoint at that time was, let's find a way to trade Carmelo Anthony. And it wasn't because I had anything against Carmelo Anthony. It was just looking at what his contract would mean where he's at in terms of his age and his talent, how you build around that. Cause the Knicks had improperly built around him to begin with doing all those things, then hoping for the best. And now this Nets team, if staying as constructed in a similar way, they're going to be a better team than Carmelo Anthony Knicks era was from 2014, 15 through the 2017, 18 season. Um, 16, 17, wherever Mello was traded. The the point is, it's they're going to be fine, but what is fine, really? Because the whole point of getting the best player to ever play in New York, at least from a home team perspective, and Kevin Durant, the expectation is you're going to make the Eastern Conference Finals. You're going to hopefully go to the Finals. You're going to hopefully win the Finals. If you're not doing any of that, then where are you at as a franchise? you're kind of stuck and that's not a place you want to be as then other teams lap you and you have to deal with rebuilding, but Oh yeah, you don't have your draft pick control really because then you had the whole situation with, uh, with the Houston Rockets because you traded for James Harden and then you traded James Harden for Ben Simmons. Who's not playing and Seth Curry, who is also injured, but is a good player and a first round pick of Philadelphia's that you're probably deferring to next year. So I don't, the, the you know the one thing about windows for the playoffs they are always shorter than you think and if they're longer than that then you've clearly done something right and it's great but it unless you have some generational foundational piece in your lineup who's like 25 years old or so and can carry you for the next 10 years your window is going to be shorter and when you have Kevin Durant who I want to say is turning 34 this year and then everything with Kyrie, it's not an enviable place. But it is, potentially, if you're a Knicks fan, because um, galaxy brain thinking of the Knicks front office, of course, and the Charlotte Hornets protected first-round pick for Cam Reddish and Solomon Hill, who never played a game, once a Nick, always a Nick. They also got back the Brooklyn second-round pick in 2025. That's a few years from now. Who knows what's going to happen? But it's another example of the Knicks finding regimes that are willing to give up second round picks or at least have been whether it's directly or indirectly and then basically um the knicks playing the waiting game in terms of yeah this could be a terrible pick but 
chances are it could also be a decently one, a decent one that that does enough for you. And if you're the Knicks, if you're trying to play the long game, that's the type of move to make. So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, that's that's pretty much the gist of the entire Brooklyn Nets situation. I know that this is not uh, a Nets podcast, but we can talk about it. We can talk about anything. It will be interesting, though, to see how they manage with Kyrie. I would imagine he opts out. But if he opts in, then again, look to, you know, look to see if he's able to control where he wants to go. If they if he's doing it because there's a location that like the Lakers where they would also deal with a sign and trade hard cap issue that opting in and being dealt somewhere makes the math work. So we shall see. Um, I realized I also forgot in our opening to say the line uh, cash rules everything around me. Oh my God. Cap rules everything around me. It's been a day. It's been a week. Cap rules everything around me. Cream, get the money. Dollar dollar bills y'all because our first question is from Ryan Huang. Thank you for getting us started. Ryan uh, it says, Hey Jeremy, love the show and glad to catch one live. Everyone thinks the front office will try to move on from some of the vets, but can you rank them from, both easiest slash hardest and most slash least likely to trade. Interesting. Let's, well, first of all, because I don't want to leave out anyone. I'm just going to take a look at the Knicks payroll quickly. Um, and the big thing about it is, you know, I mean, it's so funny to me as a fan and someone who kind of like just tries to dig into a lot of this because of the fact that we love the players we love more than anyone and we don't like the players we don't like more than anyone. Um, and then there are other teams that think of our players that we don't like as a buy low opportunity. And we say, yeah, yeah, they're, they're terrible, but take them. We'd love for you to have them. And then there's the players that we do like that fans just maybe try to say, Oh, that they're not appreciated. We could get them as a steal. And then we get upset at that. The thing about these contracts as if you've listened to the show that John and I do, it is so many of these veteran contracts were built to be moved this year. And the whole mindset of that wasn't like, Hey, let's impede the young players period. Although that certainly did eventually happen to an extent, which was not great. And hopefully we can avoid that moving forward. But it was also to basically leverage your cap space that you had last year and then turn it into a star, uh, turn it into future assets, turn it into something that you can actually use and take it with you because cap space can close up. Like, for example, the Oklahoma City Thunder, they have cap space up through the start of free agency. And then when free agency starts, the SGA contract kicks in, it goes from there. But in terms of the Knicks, so the veteran contracts that we have on the books are Julius Randle, Evan Fournier, Derek Rose, Alec Burks, Nerlens Noel, and Kemba Walker. Six players. So three of them, well, four of them really, are free agents next year if teams want it. So I guess we could start with the cheapest one, Kemba. Kemba's not a starter. I think we all know that. Uh, there were moments where he just did not look like his old self. When he was playing great individually, the Knicks often weren't benefiting from that, which is unfortunate, but a sign of the time. I, however, think that even though you could say Kemba is not a starter, it doesn't mean that he's so washed that he's not playable, right? Like, I keep going back to a team like the Hornets that was trotting out Isaiah Thomas late in the season. Like, Isaiah Thomas had a great stretch, and then injuries and, and height and all these things that that probably were going to be his Achilles heel or they came up to bite him. But if you look at someone like Kemba and it's like, yes, you could find cheaper options, but the market also might be scarce. You have to agree to having these players go somewhere. I don't think Kemba's that hard to move just because it's an expiring deal. And there's enough money out there, whether it's a larger contract and the Knicks can consolidate, which benefits them um, would be beneficial. I don't think he is the easiest one though. Um, I guess the easiest one to move is probably Alec Burks, but it's unfortunate because our mindset of Alec Burks is so different compared to the value that he actually has, which is he's not a point guard. We know this. Um, he's, he, he's a combo guard who can pull up, who can spot up, plays well. He's versatile. 
he's very he's, he like you can't look at teams like Milwaukee and Phoenix this year and think that they couldn't have used someone like him. And the beauty of his contract is if he wants to be a free agent, if they want if the team that acquires him wants him to be a free agent, he can be. If they don't, he won't be. But I think that the asset play there is two, two years. So I'm gonna actually rank him rank him first. Um second, it gets trickier. Like, I don't think Evan Fournier is impossible to move by any stretch. You could pretty easily do it. It's just a matter of what you're getting back. Um, originally, when John and I first started talking, we both were of the agreement that we think Fournier is staying put. I'm now of the belief that he'll, I don't want to say probably, but like, if you look at the talent and the guard situation that the Knicks have, and if they draft someone who... It's probably on the outside looking into the rotation anyway, but could very easily be a two, three. And then you factor in if they want to make an upgrade at the point, then that's something they consider with Fournier. So um, I think if they needed to move him, it wouldn't be that difficult, but granted, like they tried to tr- trade up what they thought was trading up with Fournier and the Dallas pick for Levert. Um, I'm going to cycle through them and then I'm going to rattle them off. Derek Rose to me, I feel I again feel like he's the player you arguably need to move second most, uh, just based on where he's at in his career, what he can offer you. Noel, the thing about Noel, and I see it all the time, is fans saying he's unhealthy. He's never a healthy player. And I just shake my head a little bit because here's the thing. Yes, he he gets nicked up enough where it feels like you can never rely on him. Every time he falls, it's like, you know, did he break something? Is he never going to play again? But this was the first year. And I think four seasons where he played under like 90% of the season, he stays healthy this year. It just, he was not himself at all. I'm going to just say he's the hardest one to move at the moment because of the fact that even though he is an expiring contract, it's easier to move. It's easier to just sign centers off of the free agent market. And then there's Julius who the reason I think he's harder to move is because as we dissected the whole trade situation, anything can change. You know, there could be three team deals that just throw everything out of whack, but I don't think the Knicks are going to give him away. And yet there's Obi Toppin where if Obi's not playing with Julius, then he's not seeing time on the floor. And if he's not seeing time on the floor, it's a bit of a problem. So, if I had to rank them, I would say, well, the most likely to be moved, Kemba, Noel, Fournier. But see, here's the thing. If the Knicks are trying to get someone like Jalen Brunson, you're not going to have Derrick Rose here. So, all right. In terms of the likeliest likelihood of moving, I'm going to go Kemba, Noel, Rose, Fournier, Burks, Randall. And in terms of easiest to move, I'll say Burks, Rose, Fournier. No, I can't say that. I can't. Because again, if you have Nerlens Noel and Kemba Walker, you can consolidate them in some way. I'll just say on their own, individually. Individually when considering the value. I guess I'll go Burks, Rose, Fournier, Randall, Kemba Noel. That's a tough one. That's really tricky. But thank you, Ryan. That was a fun thought process. So, And maybe it changes. May, maybe my answer will change depending on the day. Uh, from Camille Khan, 8. Sacramento calls and says, we'll trade you the fourth for number 11, OB or IQ, and a protected first. You doing it? Obviously, salary fillers in there. So... Not a ton of salary filling that needs to go in if it's just OB and IQ. Like, yeah, it's probably like a Mo Harkless, Alex Len type contract. Fairly small. I appreciate Camille asking this question because I know just from asking it that Camille watched our most recent podcast on trading up and understands that it costs a lot to move up. And the fact that I'm thinking like, oh, that's a lot to ask for leads me to also believe that we're close enough where it feels like a fair trade maybe not fair trade but a like we're getting there close enough um it's the because if you have to consider the fact that the knicks would have to jump at least once 
and then get there again. Um, it's probably the same cost. Would I do it? I would do it if I'm the Knicks and I see the star potential of Jaden Ivey, someone like that, maybe it's Jaden Sharp. And I, I guess from Obi's standpoint, it's more, well, if Julius is staying, then yeah, there's some merit because ideally you're moving one of them and hopefully it's not Obi. but if you had to keep Randall, I just don't see the coexisting world. And then the, I think it was the protected first. I mean, yeah, like that's, it's still a first round pick. It's just Dallas is so good. They're good enough where, yes, it takes a Luka injury, it takes stealing Jalen Brunson, whatever it might be, where it worsens their record. But you have to basically, I don't want to say be hoping, but you you have to think that an injury is the reason why they would slide. And otherwise, it's going to stay in that like early to mid-20s range. So um, I think I would. If I'm the Knicks and I really believe in the talent that's fourth overall, I would do it. I, I wouldn't like it, but that's the whole thing with trades. You also have to got to give to get. And what are you getting? You're getting the fourth overall pick. What are you giving up? 11. Obi and, um, and the Mavs pick. Yeah, I think that's that's a really great suggestion. Love it. Um, from Kevin Danishevsky. What are your thoughts on the Knicks, including Rokas in a package for a star? How much value do you think he has? Which team would he be appealing for? Does it work with the cap? Thoughts on uh, AB moving AB, I would imagine being Alec Burks. Um, all right. So first things first, if the Knicks move Rokas, the nice thing about Rokas as an asset is because he hasn't come over stateside. He's not under contract. Um, he was a second round pick. Second round picks do not have values attached to them. First round rookie scales for first rounders. So with Rokas, um, you could include him in a star and a team that is willing to be patient. They might welcome him with open arms. But then again, if Rokas is coming over in 2023, maybe it's 2024, whatever it is, like that's not too far down the road. So they can be a little bit more strategic about that. Uh, in terms of value, you know, it's their thoughts of where Rokas would land in this draft if he were there right now uh, and not having been drafted previously. I've seen some people say top 20. I've seen others say, yeah, he's probably around where he was taken. Um, you know, because the thing about a draft pick is at the point it's a pick, it could be anything. And then when it's a player, it's certainly something else. But when you win a rising stars award, you're clearly doing the job. You're being asked in the second most competitive basketball league in the world. There's value to that. So I'd say with Rokas, yeah, he definitely should have some value, but it's more like he's, he's going to be a side dish. He's not going to be the entree. He probably isn't the appetizer either, but there's value there. I mean, in a league where pull up shooting and ball handling are very, very much premiums. Um, he offers that. So that's that is something to consider in terms of what team he'd be appealing for. I mean, Utah. <laughs> I'm not just saying that for the very obvious reason. I'm saying that because if you're looking at basically how things are structured and the fact that he can be traded with relative ease considering the draft rights, you could say that, hey, if there's a star trade for someone like Donovan Mitchell, if that's where he would go. And it makes total sense for why he would be appealing to them for the contract for if they're deciding to blow it up, they would want to build around younger players. Um, so I think that that works. And yeah, again, it, it does work with the cap because there's no number attached. No amount is there. And then for uh, Alec Burks moving, I want to move Alec Burks for the reason being that I just see too many players ahead of him and too many players that also should be playing. I don't want to get rid of him for nothing, right? The Knicks have shown that they're willing to stand pat, especially with Alec Burks and not just trade him for the sake of trading. him. If I'm the Knicks, RJ Barrett is my starting three. If it's not Evan Fournier at the two, then again, I, my preference is a consolidation candidate, like a player like Gordon Hayward, who, when healthy, can give you something. When not healthy, you can shift everyone up. If Grimes is on the team still, 
then I would imagine he moves from the second unit to the first. And then if the Knicks are taking, you know, a two, three, then that player is then in line to get minutes. But then you have to look at who's manning the three. Okay. Well, Cam Reddish, if he's still here, then he's got to see minutes, but Alec Burks is blocking him. But Alec Burks is also taking minutes away from the player. The Knicks might draft, but if the Knicks draft a four, then you could conceivably still have Alec Burks, but then you have to deal with Rose and moving. It's just, it's so tangled, which is why moving Rose, moving Burks, are just a couple of the guys who are useful players and can provide value elsewhere, but might be better suited not staying here. So we don't have to deal with a log jam of the youth. Like it's one thing to have too many youth, too many young guys and not getting playing time that way. It's because you're losing time to, to other young players, but when it's younger players losing time to older veterans and they're like way, way back in the rotation, then it becomes a problem. So, um, yeah, my thoughts on Alec Burks moving is if you're keeping Cam Reddish, you're probably going to have to move Fournier. And you're probably going to have to move. Well, you don't have to move Fournier, but you should. Bottom line, it's just easier to move him. It solves a lot of the Knicks problems. Uh, Mino F. Jeremy, let's say Sharp or Ivy fell to pick six or seven and the Knicks decided to trade up. How far would you be willing to go to trade up and what's the cutoff point? So six is the Pacers. The Pacers are a potential Randall team. And it goes back to, though, do they value Randall enough to really want him? I've been hesitant towards the idea of using Randall as a trade up candidate. It's more getting something that's of more value than that. If the Knicks see a prospect that is a can't miss guy, and if Randall is the way that they could go about doing that, there's value to it. I wouldn't agree with it, but I'd understand it, and I'd, and I'd be happy to rock and roll with it. I guess the cutoff point for me is, you know, if you're trading up four or five spots, you need to throw at least a first in there. They'll probably look for a young player, too. I mean, are we talking like 11 for or excuse me, six, four, 11 Grimes first round pick. That's Dallas's. We're talking about a protected Knicks pick. I don't know. Um, I mean, naturally because it's not the Knicks asset and it's worse in value than there's the Mavs pick that I would prefer to give up. I think that's probably where I'd be at for six and seven the most, but I also recognize that that might not be something that appeals to either of those teams. Then you wonder, okay, well, what about the Detroit second round pick in 2023? Because there's a chance that that is 31. Well, probably won't be 31. They've got Cade. But like 35, 36, it's valuable. It's something. Could throw that in there too. I think that's probably my cutoff point. And I know it may not seem like a ton to move up, but I just keep going back to like that Cam Johnson type deal where it was swapping and then Sarich. I'd like to think that Grimes is a good asset enough to move up four spots. So I'd maybe be a little hesitant with the Mavs pick and that Detroit pick. I'd probably give the Mavs pick and Grimes and and it would sting, but I'd be at peace knowing got one of those players. It's probably the most I would do if we're not talking about larger contracts. Um, Reynaldo Maldonado. Hey, Jeremy, you think the Knicks can trade for Alexander from the Thunder, and how would that trade look like? I don't think they could do it right now. Yeah, I, um, I've i certainly been asked about SGA before, and uh, there's a, a group chat that I'm in with Schwinn and Prez, and I got a little heat because may or may not call trading for SGA with five years left on his contract fan fiction, and I stand by it. Again, like I do. I think that if the Thun if the Knicks had the first pick overall and the Thunder desperately wanted someone and SGA made some sort of you know stink about wanting to go elsewhere, like there you could find a way. That ship sailed long ago, the moment that the ping pong ball for eleven uh well showed up as that. I think the thing with SGA too is like if if you're the Thunder yeah, they're ta they tanked, but and they've done it shamelessly, but they've only done it for two years. 
and their thought process probably let's tank one more year and then we can try to do everything we can to get uh victor Wembanyama. i keep butchering his last name but my apologies victor you're great you're gonna do great but if you are the thunder then you can basically try to rock and roll from there so like you have sga you have giddy you have chet or jabari and you've got a top five pick next year and that's when you really try to make the play in push and you know if sga didn't want to be a member of the thunder for longer then he shouldn't have signed the contract and that's the the whole philosophy now right like get your money and go and you can always figure out the rest later that is the type of he's the type of player where down the line maybe when there's a year or two years left on his contract that's when he's poachable if he wants to leave if another team wants to take him if the thunder want to trade him we could be looking at a paul george type haul just for that so i don't think sga is really on the market for another three years unless the knicks make a significant and i mean significant trade right like i'm talking rj i'm talking this year's pick um picks in the future like he's one of the best under 25 players in the nba and the Thunder are the ones coming at it from a position of strength. I just don't see it. Not for a couple of years. But maybe then. Maybe then something could work out. Uh, from Ryan Z. Thoughts on Randall, Kemba, and 11 to Portland. Seven, Fournier, Noel, the Charlotte first to, uh, and New York, two New York seconds, and Cam, question mark, to the Kings, Bledsoe, Holmes, Burks to Charlotte, Hayward, and four to New York. Okay, give me a second, Ryan. Let me let me redo that. Okay, so Randall and Kemba are going to Portland. 11 is going with them. The Knicks are then finding a way to trade up all the way to the fourth pick and taking on Hayward. Meanwhile, they're sent, I, So the Kings... Sorry, just trying to process. I, I think that the Kings are probably out just based on the fact. Well, I, there's a lot of salary. A lot of salary from the Knicks' perspective is going out. So it's probably not going to work out anyway. But if you can find a way to make the salaries match, you're closer. I'll take your word for it. Maybe maybe you plug this into the trade machine and it worked out that way. And, and, and if that's the case, I'll take your word for it and going. Um, just a lot of money that's exchanging hands. I guess if you're the Kings, do you want to trade from four to seven? Potentially, but you're also probably looking for a star. And the way that the superstar talent or star talent tends to be in the top five, it's probably a greater chance of doing that. Because theoretically, if you're Sacramento, you could also make the trade, not including the draft picks. You could just wait until free agency and then say, all right, we don't need Rashawn Holmes anymore because clearly we're prioritizing DeMontis Sabonis. Um, and we've got some other contracts that we can package around. So I think if you're the Knicks, then this is obviously a huge win, which is why then in my head I'm thinking, whoa, 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 okay. What is it that other teams are doing wrong? And I'd say if you're Portland, I get the idea of you're moving back four spots. You get Randall. That makes total sense if they want Julius Randle. Um, and then, yeah, if you're... I think this is... I think if you broke this up, Ryan, and you you probably took out the draft pick parts, which I know is obviously the incentivizing part of why it's being suggested, there's actually a lot to work with here. It's more just like trading all that way, trading contracts that I think fans think are like neutral at best to, even if they're expiring, to get four and Hayward. Knicks are probably coming out a little too far ahead, but yeah, separate the two. Maybe we can, we can get something going. Uh, Johnny Chiba, Jeremy, who are your favorite draft targets and who will be New York Knicks starting point guard to start the season? Thank you. I, I like Matherin. Like Tari Eason, Johnny Davis. I'd say those are probably three of the guys that I like 
but I think Tari at 11 might be a bit of a bit of a stretch. If the Knicks traded back, maybe if they got like 13 and if it were a three team deal, right? Where it's like Knicks go to 13 and the Hornets get 11 and then 15 goes to another team and that other team sends a future asset of sorts, then that, you know, that's when I think you could probably get away with taking Tari. But in terms of the ass, you know, the other guys, I think those are probably my three optimal based on how the Knicks are operating, you know, because you want best player available hundred percent, but you also do have to take some fit into account because then it impacts the other players. So I'd, I'd go with those three Matherin. I'll say Matherin Davis Eason, maybe in that order. I just think there's something to be said of in a league that values versatility and defense stocking up on athletic wings and guards even if you're at a huge surplus can only help you if you make that trade in a year and you're loading up and then you still have uh room to grow you haven't completely emptied the keg and in terms of nick's starting point guard to start the season i'm sure by now you all know my thoughts on jalen brunson we'll talk about him for a cap or no cap fairly soon. I would say the challenge with that, of course, is that it's it's not even the moving of the money. It's getting him to come to New York, how much it will cost, how much the Mavs are willing to pay. So I'm, if I say Brunson, I think it's a kind of boring because we've been down that road and B, I feel like if I say it, it's not going to happen. So I'm not going to say Brunson. I'm not going to say Brogdon for reasons explained. But again, it's just like the injuries, the age. I think in theory, who he is, is better than the player you're actually getting. I'll be bold. I'm not saying I would like this. I'm not saying I would like it, but I'll be bold. As an attempt to change up the consolidation efforts, the logjam, Calling up Utah, seeing what Mike Conley's up to, seeing if you can trade, you know, Burks and Fournier for Conley. I mean, obviously, I'm sure they they might even want Randall. I don't know if they'd want Randall. It all depends on what they do at the five with Gobert, but some sort of deal where the Knicks are basically taking on Conley. Um, I'll say him. But, you know, he... He does a lot of what the Knicks like. Again, I don't want it. Not interested. Unless it's heavily incentivized, and I don't even know what Utah can really do in order to do it, because they're not going to just dump Mike Conley for the sake of it. Although, I still feel that their best path moving forward is to get rid of Conley, to shift Donovan Mitchell down to the one, and then probably look for more plus defenders two through four. I don't know if the Knicks can necessarily help that unless it's Alec Burks or maybe it's an engaged Julius Randle, but probably not. Um, and then just to talk about uh, Kevin, responding to an earlier point, um, he says, uh, Kevin Danishevsky, I'll put in writing for Jeremy, agreed with what you said about SGA, but IQ OB this year's first, Dallas first, 2024 first, broke us for SGA. This would fit really nicely with OKC's timeline. Yeah, but SGA is their timeline. But he's he's still super young. And that's the thing. It's just like if we if, if there's the one year where they get through it, and then they get through that year, and then they can tank and go with that, then it, it makes a lot of sense. Um I'm being told by my wonderful producer, Andrew, to add something, super chat comment that he has. He says, hey, Jeremy, first time, long time. To piggyback on Reynaldo's question about SGA, hope, uh, hypothetically, is there any world, even fan fictional, where the Knicks can trade for him without including RJ? I, I, that's the thing. You want to have RJ and SGA. If you are the Thunder and you're trading five years of team control of your best asset theoretically um 
because he's a proven player and the second pick overall hasn't played a single minute in the NBA. What, I mean, you'd want the world from the other team. You'd like, if you're another team that's betting on SGA's upside and it's really up, then if you're Oklahoma city, why, why would you settle for anything less than a massive overpay? And so I think with what Kevin's saying in terms of like IQ, OB picks, you know, a lot of that, there's not like this, there's not the entree there. There's some great, great side dishes and appetizers. There's even some dessert. But I think that you'd have to probably have RJ be that entree. And then at a certain point, it's like you're getting SGA in the building. He's a better player than RJ. And quantity, as I've said before, often is not greater than quality. Quality reigns supreme. But if you're trading a whole lot of quantity, and I mean a quantity that maybe we've never even seen, then it gets to a point where the seesaw goes back the other way. And it's like, you got a guy, SJ, in the building that's important, but how do you build around him? Because free agency, there's not a whole lot going on there. You'd have to trade for someone. You'd have to basically wait for a sign and trade. Who's a free agent that you want? Well, this year... I mean, we're talking Zach Levine, but you then have the knee issue. And why is he necessarily coming here if the Knicks have traded a lot of their haul? So you wait another year. Okay, well, it's Jokic. He's going to sign a Supermax. Um, LeBron, but he's not. it's not going to happen. Who knows the situation with Devin Booker and Carl Anthony Towns is now that they've been named to an all-NBA team. They can extend. So, But we're getting further and further, and it's like, what are you doing to really upgrade the team at that point? Couldn't you have just been served better of waiting? And I think that's the argument. Waiting. Patience. It's a virtue. We all struggle with it. SGA, I think you just have to wait until the time on his contract burns out, assuming he wants to go. If that's the case, then you make the move there. Otherwise, it's just, you're probably giving up too much. And as Andrew's saying, the Thunder would want RJ. And they'd have every right to want RJ. Because if we were in that position... And some other team were trying to steal our best player from us. We'd ask for the world to. Uh, this is from Buzzer Beater. Are we trying to move Noel to sign Mitch? Uh, no, because they're not. They, they're not. One doesn't lead to the other. Um, Noel is maybe his presence here affects Jericho Sims more, but Noel's already under contract. Mitch, the Knicks have his Berg rights. But I have to, I got to say, maybe other people feel this way. Maybe they feel I'm being a little dramatic here. But every single time I see a Mitchell Robinson shooting video, I feel like the odds of him staying on the Knicks drop at least 10%. Because at a certain point, you see something that's so frequent and it's like, all right, like that's cool. At first, like, let's unleash Mitch, the jump shooter. This is great. And then he doesn't do it. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, you don't need to have him shooting because he just does the things he does really well, and he should improve upon that. And then social media can be odd because we see the things we want to see. Not everything's shown. You can market yourself in a way. But it seems that the way that Mitch keeps getting marketed either as himself or by himself or from his trainer is, hey, look at him taking these shots. Not like, look at him at the free throw line. Because that's not glamorous. Um, look at him working on positioning, perhaps. like There are various thoughts, that there are things he could do where it just keeps feeling like he's itching to shoot the ball. And he doesn't have that opportunity here. And as we've discussed, probably won't get that opportunity here. And if that's the case, he can go anywhere. Just a little side thought that I had as I watched him take another video trying to rain threes from the top of the key. Anywho, um, from Vasco Albuquerque. First of all, you're the man, Jeremy. Thank you, Vasco. Uh, watching this all the way from Portugal. Uh, lovely. Always wanted to go. Uh, second, don't you think we're more likely to trade down than trade up, given what we've done last year? E the reason I want to say yes and the no is because the first instinct for the Knicks has been both years to trade up. 
And then when the player they maybe don't like is gone, then they trade down. So I think if they love someone, like when John and I talked about this, there was kind of a prevailing thought. This is the fun thing about having a podcast and then speaking on something and then reflecting on it. It's like, you know, on second thought, maybe maybe that isn't something. Maybe it's maybe it's a little different. I said trading back to 13, doing some sort of pick situation with the Hornets. I now feel like if you look at a team like the Pelicans, maybe the Spurs want to move up, but maybe the Blazers want to move down. Maybe the Wizards, though they're only one spot ahead, but we've seen teams that are next to each other making trades, that sort of thing. And I think that if you look at the, like from the Pelicans perspective, they can go best player available, but they're already, it's gravy because they're playing with another team's pick. That's the dream. A top 10 pick that they get to use that isn't even their own. And they had a great season. They're not a tax paying team. If they wanted to trade down and get a future asset that should shave off some of the money that they owe their players on the payroll this year, but also more importantly, perhaps next year, because the 2023-24 season is theoretically the first year that Zion Williamson would be making a lot of money. And you've got Zion, you've got Brandon Ingram, CJ McCollum, and you have Jonas Valanciunas. And then you have to worry about depth. And some of those guys, most of those guys are probably on rookie contracts. But still, you're you're going to get kind of close to that margin. And so if that's the case, it might make a lot of sense for you to trade back. Enter the Knicks. I don't know how many teams would want to trade up to eight. If you're the Spurs and you're sitting pretty at nine, do you really want to trade up? Maybe not. If you're the if you're the Wizards, are you that desperate to move from 10 to eight? Maybe. Um, but you're also maybe not as interested. I don't know. Um, the Wizards don't have a ton of assets that make sense for them to trade. At least that, that help them. And then if you're the Knicks, if you feel like one of the teams ahead might snag a player, then you should consider trading up. So I, I think that I, I actually think now that that would be the first instinct. And we saw that the Knicks aren't super possessive of that Dallas pick due to the fact that they were willing to include it in an Evan Fournier deal for Karis LeVert because they wanted that type of uh, rim attacking in LeVert, getting him to create something from there. So I'll go with, I'll go with that they trade up. I'll switch it. Uh, <laughs> Andrew pitting the uh, the comment that he himself has written. The capital of Portugal is Lisbon. Yes. Yes, it is, Andrew. It's Lisbon. 100%. Um, from Ryan Z. Another one. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, if New York takes Plumley, the money works. I think Sacramento would be okay dropping to seven because Matherin, um, Keegan Murray, Dyson Daniels. Sorry, the I, I, I'm still not used to their initials yet, but but 100%. Keegan Murray, Dyson Daniels is a uh, better fit, and they add a first cam and need some shooting in Evan Fournier. Yeah, I, I, I totally see the logic and where you're going with it. I just think that if you are going from four to 11, it's, or I know it's four to seven. Sorry. If you're going from four to seven, it's still a sizable drop because you could like, if, if you see star potential in Ivy, you could just draft him and then trade him later. Like that's sort of what they did with Fox and Halliburton and Davian Mitchell. They had three of them and then they turned one of them into a player of better need. So if you're another team, um, like, if you're the Kings, just take the best player available. And you can always figure it out midseason. You can always figure it out next year. I know they want to make the playoffs. They can always do some other tinkering. But th make no mistake, they're the ones who are in a position of power. They hold leverage on other teams. And I expect them to try to up their floor, but also look for ways to increase their ceiling as much as they can. And when you have a top four pick, it's pretty important. From Buzzer Beater. Over under 30 days until Tibbs is fired. I'm going to say over. I'm going to I'm gonna take the over. If we're saying 30 days from now, definitely the over. If we're saying next season, still going to take the over. But I will say that the schedule 
will be fascinating because if the Knicks have a particularly tough schedule and can't get off the ground, maybe they make a change. If they have an easy schedule and they're underperforming, maybe they do the same thing. But I think that my guess, unless we're talking about an absolute disaster going on, the Knicks probably don't get rid of Tibbs midseason. It's not even like really a respect or CAA thing. I think it's more just like if we if we fire him, are we putting the next person in the best position to succeed? And the best person is probably Johnny Bryant. You could have him midseason. But obviously the rational argument to that is like, well, why wouldn't you let Johnny Bryant take a stab at it if, if Tibbs is gone? And I think it's valid. But then I think it's the politics. Where settling everything you have in house at the end of the season, exit meetings, all that, search for a new coach. But uh, yeah, I'm going to take the the over. Next season will be the season for for Tibbs to to make or break here. I'll put it that way. Uh, Mino F. Hey Jeremy, do you think Tibbs is the right guy to heighten the value of our young guys? Uh, on the Tibbs train. All right. I feel like guys like IQ and Obi are underrated slash undervalued around the league, part two, partially due to playing time opportunity. <sighs> From the fan perspective, no, right? Because we all see when these players don't have the opportunities. And then you listen to what some of them talk about. Like Fred Katz had a great article. Now, you're not going to hear these players saying a bad thing about Tibbs, but it seemed like they weren't just acknowledging how hard he made them work, but appreciative of it. And it goes back to the whole thought process of like so much of what we don't see is a problem. And it's almost like if you feel like you still need Tibbs to instill the foundation, well, that's slightly problematic because you would hope by now it, it's there. But also if you're comfortable with that foundation and as we've sort of gone over, if the Knicks are just biding time until their next big move, whatever that is, then he's a placeholder and it works. Some of the offensive sets, schemes, ugly stuff. Um, I think the bottom line here is that the Knicks need another, they need, a, they need an upgrade at the point um, in some manner. At least that's what, what their philosophy will be. And then they'll say, no excuses. We have a better point guard after last season didn't work out. Not that last season was the reason why Tibbs failed. I, I just want to be abundantly clear about that or why the Knicks failed. It was a reason wasn't the reason, um, but still it has a factor to it. Give him more horses. If he's able to ride, then that's the case. But for the younger guys, this is why I, I'm, the Knicks should be all over consolidating the veterans and seeing if they can extract value. If they can't, and the younger players aren't playing and the Knicks are losing like they did this year with the older players. That is as much a front office issue as is a Tibbs issue, but it is still a Tibbs issue because if he's the one who's controlling playing time and if he's the one who's feeling a bit remorseful about the lack of playing time that went to the younger players, then it's just as much on him. Um, all right. Last question. So it would seem. That's why I guess. All right. Last question is from Kevin Danishevsky. Uh, Thank you, Jeremy. Appreciate your perspective. As always, if the Knicks don't feel like selling low on Randall and feel like they need to give up Obi, what's a potential move you can see? If I'm the Knicks and I'm going down this path, I'm waiting until free agency starts. And then from there, I am looking to see... I mean, he was taken eighth overall, so right off the bat, I'm pointing to what he was able to do at the end of the season against actually good teams and saying, we're getting a first round pick. We are settling for nothing worse than a first round pick. Um, and it probably wouldn't be one of those like, Hey, this is like the 28th pick overall. Take it. I'm sure the Knicks would want a mid teens, early twenties pick. And basically the reason why it wouldn't be better than that it's because you've moved two years off of Obi's contract. He's halfway through his rookie deal. He's a little bit older as a, pro, as, a as a player. At the same time, I think that we're seeing fours who could be switchable and hit open shots. Kind of I, the conversation that's been around players like Grant Williams 
who's a heck of a player. It's becoming more and more reminiscent of like, oh, teams need a three and D wing. And it's like the perfect prototype. And I think NBA fans just fall in love with an, with an archetype of a player and then need those pieces to be there. But the players always needed to be there. It's just maybe they're the ones getting spotlit. So um, I, that's the lowest I ask. But if I'm the Knicks as well, it's like, okay, I probably don't just want to like jettison Obi for a pick. I probably want to package Obi with someone else uh, or something else to get a better player. And I think that's ultimately the path that the Knicks should pursue. If they feel that the log jam exists, they want to build around Randall. They're willing to move Obi. Tibbs isn't playing Obi at the five. All rough ideas, but nevertheless, if I'm the Knicks, I'm not looking to see how I can get a future pick. It's an option, but the primary thing I'm doing is how can I turn Obi and maybe a couple of other young assets into a far better player, whether it's someone who is like already star caliber or young enough where they're on the verge. Wouldn't be SGA, but it would be someone who I'd have to look at the teams and think about it, but someone who's good enough, good enough to be in the rotation from day one, which Obi Toppin is. We have one last thing, one last, last thing. And I know, I know where he's going with this. I already can tell it's from Andrew Claudio. One more question. Rangers and six. One more answer. Hurricanes and six. Again, I'm not backing off on this. If I say it, it won't come true. And maybe it doesn't come true regardless. I believe, but I won't say it. Just can't do it. What I will say, though, is Rangers should be up 3-1, but that's neither here nor there. Got to play 60 minutes of hockey. Got to play 48 minutes of basketball. Got to play nine full innings of, uh, of baseball. Or in the Yankees' case last night, he was 11. In the Mets' case, we won't talk about it. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate all of you being here. And uh, great opportunity. We're going to do this again, obviously. going to keep doing it. Keep giving me questions. I'll keep giving you answers. So uh, thank you so much. And um, we got some actually fun things. You may see me on a podcast before our uh, weekly scheduling that I do with John. So stay tuned for that. And John also had a great episode today um, with a member of the Utah Jazz community. Um, I, I'm not going to remember his last name, but I can easily remember his first name due to the fact that uh, it is very similar to mine. Um, first name, Jeremiah, last name, not Bullfrog, but um, something of the sort. I'm sure Andrew will uh, slap me on the wrist, and rightfully so. But regardless, thank you all so much. Um, cat check draft class with Chris Persiana, new episode coming out. And until then, enjoy tonight's game. Hopefully it's not a blowout.